welcome, guys, wherever you are today. If you're at 6 p.m. tonight, maybe down in Gulfport or here at the 6 p.m. service at Lincoln Road, or maybe you're just on the other side of a computer screen, or you're at the Hunt Club, or you're at Stone County, or you're right here in the East Venue, wherever you are, man, thanks for being with us today. And I got to tell you guys, I'm really excited about this series. This has been such a cool series called Your Venture. Now, Your Venture is really different because for us, normally, we'll do a message series and then we'll just move on to the next message series and it kind of just keeps going like that. But this series is different. You need to know this. Your Venture is going to turn into a two-week discipleship class. We're going to do this at every one of our campuses. It starts March the 3rd at 930 and it's for anybody that's been coming to venture and you're just going, hey, I haven't found my place. I really don't know that I've discovered my purpose. I don't have a role in what's going on here. And I need, I, need, I need more information. I need the next step. Listen, your pathway to helping you find your purpose isn't just this series. It's going to be a two-week thing. We start March the 3rd at 930. You don't have to sign up. Just show up at every campus that day. It's going to be a neat class, okay? You don't want to miss it. It'll help you find your purpose and your next step. All right. Hey, so this series started last week. Jeff did a great job, and he said all of us are going to start at the same place in discovering our purpose, in discovering our place. And he said it starts with, maybe you remember this, it was real simple. It starts with becoming alive in Christ. Now, if you missed that message, go back and see it because that is our starting place. We all start at the same place. We become alive in Christ. Now, this week, we're going to talk about what do you do next? I mean, what's our next step? Now that you've accepted Christ, maybe you've been saved or you've been reborn or you've become alive. You can say that a lot of different ways. What do you do after that? Now, one thing about this message, and I want to go ahead and say this because I think this is important. Some of you, maybe you're watching or maybe you're in one of our venues right now. And the truth is, man, you, you just really had not put your faith in Christ yet. I tell you, that's okay. This message is still for you. In fact, this message is going to help you see what would it look like if I chose to really give my life to Christ. And so in some ways for you, this message will be prescriptive. But for those of you that you've put your faith in Christ, this message should be descriptive. This should help you see, how should I be living my life? What does it look like to be a follower of Christ? Because maybe you don't know. So we're going to start in Scripture in just a minute. And we're going to start with a passage that 3,000 people have just put their faith in Christ. Maybe you know that passage. It was called Pentecost, right? And then the Holy Spirit came down, and there was this movement of God. And all of a sudden, 3,000 people put their faith in Christ. So what did they do next? So what should we do next? Now, one thing you need to know before we get to the Scripture, okay? One thing you need to know is this. I say the word church. I'm going to say it a lot over the next 25 minutes. When you hear the word church, I don't want you to think venture. I don't want you to think bowling alley. I don't want you to think bar. I don't want you to think Gulfport High School gym. I want you to think me and you. We are the church. Men, you need to know that. And so when you hear church, don't think the church you grew up in. Don't think a contemporary or traditional. Don't think Baptist or Catholic. Mm -mm, not a building. Think a follower of Christ. Because that's what we're going to be describing. Is what would it look like for the church, you and me, to follow him? What do we do next? All right. So here we go. Let's read this together, man. I think you're going to love it. Acts 2, 41 through 47. Acts 2, 41 through 47, you can get it on the app if that's easier for you. It'll be on the screens. Maybe you've heard this before. I love this passage. It says, those who accepted his message, they were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to that number that day. So 3,000 people just came to Christ. What did they do next? Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Man, everyone was filled with awe, and the many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. Man, all the believers, they were together, and, and they had everything in common. They sold property, and they sold possessions to give to one another, anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Man, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised, they worshipped God. And they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And then the Lord added to their number daily. Those that were being saved. Now, here we go. Three things about the first followers that needs to be true about us. The very first one, it says, they were devoted to each other. I want to start with each other. 
Listen, the Christian faith, the first followers, they were devoted to one another. It wasn't like a private, personal faith. A lot of times when we think about our faith and our journey, it's, it's like think of a tennis match. And it's like this singles match, and it's, it's me against David. And how much scripture does he know? Who can find the book of Psalms first? You know, how many Sundays did you make? How many did you miss? Oh, who won? That's not the idea. Sometimes when we think of it, it's like a tennis match and it's me against the enemy. And he's not going to stump me this time. I'm going to fight better this time. I'm going to recover quicker this time. No one can understand me because everything's so private and it's only me against the enemy. And it's a one-on-one singles match. That's not it. And when we look at this passage and we see the way that Luke was describing these first people that accepted Christ, he says they were like a body. It's like they were together. It was like it was a team sport. It wasn't an individual thing where everyone had their own section and their own seat and everyone was private. He says it was like a body. He said fellowship. Now, here's a part of today's message. i got to go ahead and get this out there. One of the things you're going to need to do is it's almost going to be like detox. All right, you know detox, right? It's when you rid your body of a chemical or a harmful thought. Okay, there's some things in your mind when you think church, you're going to have to detox. And one of those is what it means to be in fellowship. Because when I think fellowship, I think cheap chicken in the fellowship hall. You do too. And that's not what he meant by fellowship. I mean, fellowship, he gives us a definition. He says fellowship is a deep sense of togetherness. And fellowship is where they found protection. Oh, wait a minute. Man, they were in fellowship. It meant they were walking together through life. And it meant they protected each other from all the different things that come up in life. If you're just coming and going, you don't have a lot of protection. But man, if you are in fellowship with people, then you have people speaking into your life going, I don't know that that's a good idea. You have people speaking into your life saying, hey, I really missed you. And listen, fellowship brought about protection. Here's why this is so important. Maybe you've heard this verse before, 1 Peter 5, 8. This hit me for the first time. This is so powerful. It says, be on alert. Be of sober mind. You ready? The enemy, you know this about the enemy. He prowls around. It means he's active. He's prowling around and he's looking for someone to devour. But I want you to see who he's looking for. You ready? It says he's looking for someone. That's how he's looking for a church to devour. He's going to say he's looking for a growth group to come after doesn't say he's looking for a recovery class to really get after. He says he's looking for someone. Listen, Satan's trophy room is full of Christians who have left community and thought they could do it alone. And he says that's the one the enemy's looking for. He says when you walk out of community, when you walk out of fellowship, it's like you're waving this big red flag saying, come get me. I don't need anybody in my life. I can take on the world alone. And he says, oh, that's the one I'm coming after. That's the one I want to get. That's the one I want to devour because they're all alone. They're vulnerable. And then Luke didn't even stop there. He said, listen, Luke's right next, okay? This is where this is coming from. And he's just describing everything he's seeing. And he starts with this idea that they were together. And then he says, my goodness, they were were devoted to one another. I'm not sure that's one of the biggest differences between us and, and them is a sense of devotion. I mean, they were deeply devoted to doing life together. It wasn't a casual, I'll come when I can or when it's convenient, but instead it was a devotion. Now listen, I'm all about a Sunday morning experience or a 6 p.m. experience. Of course, man, we want you to come anytime, and we're not taking attendance, and it's just, man, it's an open door thing. But here's the deal. This is the starting point. This isn't the ending point. And when you look at Acts 2, it wasn't just all about a Sunday morning, did you come or did you not? It was about, listen, was there a place that you started and then you grew from there? And you were devoted to relationships with people outside of the context of just rows that you sat and you listened, but you did life together. And listen, this this community is is kind of a buzzword and it's fun, but community was hard. I mean, you get this, right? This is kind of easy. I mean, it's a little hard to be here maybe. Maybe you had to travel or you had to get a bunch of kids ready or... You had to wait on your wife, or I don't know what it looked like for you. But this is, this is fairly simple. But then when you start doing community, I started thinking about the things that makes community hard. Here, here, this is, for me, what makes community hard, number one, is bearing each other's burdens. Y'all got some burdens. I got some burdens. I got some things about me that are hard sometimes. 
And when we're really living in community, you're willing to carry my burdens in some difficult seasons of my life. And that's not easy. And sometimes when you're in group, people might talk too much. Or, man, they might come from a place that you can't even understand. But community, fellowship is this idea that we're going to help one another. We're going to be with each other through that season. The second thing they did was, listen, they, they managed their schedules. I mean, if you're going to really do life together, if you're going to be in fellowship, then it means you make other people a priority. I think, mean, again, confession, i got to tell you, that's hard. We do a group at our house on Wednesday nights, and just this week, we had someone sick in our family, and we had soccer practice, and we had baseball. And when it came time for Wednesday night growth group and for 24 folks to come over, we didn't really want them to come. And then we thought, but wait a minute, we're devoted to something. And we said, you know what, we need them to come because we need them to speak into our life. And when they left, Katie and I looked at each other and thought, man, I'm glad we did this. Because we need that in our life. We need that sense of community. But for that to happen, we have to manage babysitters. For that to happen, we have to plan food. For that to happen, we have to sacrifice some time. For that to happen, we have to make it a priority and we have to push through some things that can be difficult. One thing that gets in the way sometimes of fellowship, now if you're really honest, this one, I could take more of this, but this is the truth, is success. I mean, you know this. You remember the person that used to always come and then they got a place at the beach and they never come now? I'm not telling you I blame them, but I am telling you, man, it hurt them being a part of a community. And so sometimes the more successful we are and the more means we have, the more we travel and the less we're committed to a place. Success gets in the way. Finally, and let's just be honest about this one. I know this is true of you. Sometimes sports gets in the way. I mean, doesn't it? Maybe you really want to be in a group, but your, man, your life is just full because your kids are playing on different sports teams. And I'm not against that. My kids play on sports teams, and I love sports teams. I think that's where they learn discipline and teamwork. So many things happen in that moment that are powerful. But here's what I know. Sports make a terrible God. And sometimes sports gets in the way of us being devoted. Maybe you're devoted to a style. Maybe you're devoted to a particular service. Maybe you're devoted to a communicator, a singer, a location. Here's my fear. Is that we would look up and say, man, we were devoted to a bunch of distractions. And at the end of the day, the distractions don't bring fulfillment. They leave us empty. And when you look at those first followers in Acts 2, and Luke's just describing them, and he's going, here's what I see in them. He says, listen, man, I can tell what they were devoted to. They were devoted to each other. As I watch their life, I see them really being together. They were devoted to Jesus. When you look at your life and you just observe your life, or if I did, what would I come back and say, hey, man, that's what Craig's devoted to. You know, that's, that's, that's what that family's devoted to. I just see it in them. Luke says they were devoted to Jesus, and they were devoted to the church. They were devoted to each other. Now, parents, let me ask you something. Uh, what would you do on Monday morning if your kids come cruising down the hall and say, listen, man, I, just, I didn't sleep so good last night. I don't think I'm going to go to school today. I mean, there's 180 days we go to school. I'm going to sit this one out. You'd say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We're devoted to your education. Let's go. Get back up there and change your clothes and come back and try again. There's not a chance you're sitting this one out. This is something we're devoted to. It's your education. Look, what would it be like if we were that kind of devotion to our spiritual life? Man, are you, you just getting on to them because I don't come enough? No. I couldn't be farther from the truth. But what I am telling you is in Acts 2, they were devoted to being together. And that there's value in being together regularly. Because it sharpens us, it encourages us. He says specifically, Acts 2, when he watched these people, he said, I could see that they were devoted to God's word. Now listen, it's never been easier for us to be devoted to God's word than now. Right? If you've got you version on your phone, you can find a Bible reading plan in a, just a, one search. If you've got you version, you can change the translation of the Bible. Listen, if you still got a King James Bible, maybe you speak in Old English, and that's awesome. But the rest of us, man, you can grab a translation that you can understand. Man, listen, your, your, your Bible, the Word of God, it's not just a, like a cup holder or like grandmother's heirloom. It's like, no, man, that's something you're devoted to. He says they were devoted to God. They were devoted to God's Word. They were devoted to fellowship. One hundred times in the New Testament. That blew my mind. 100 times in the New Testament, the word each other 
He said, no, this was a life. This was a journey that they did together. That's why we do what we do every week. Have you ever wondered that? I mean, is it just kind of tradition? You've started something, you can't miss it now? I mean, why do they come together every Sunday? Why not make it once a month? Is it just to take up an offering? No. It's because we need each other. It's not about the Bible Belt. It's not about tradition. It's not about putting people in these seats in this building. It's the idea that, man, when we're trying to do life together and we want to live for Jesus, then we need each other in our life to spur us along and to encourage us. That's why we say get in a group. That's why we say come to recovery. That's why we say come on Sunday mornings or Sunday night at 6. Be committed to a body because you're going to need it. Now, the next thing Luke does, and I love this. This is probably my, my favorite part of this little passage. Because I can just see it. I feel like I see Luke sitting at his desk and he's watching these first followers. Man, there's 3,000 of them and he's going, what is it about them? I mean, how do I tell the next generation what these people look like so that they can look like them? And then he just uses this word. He's like, I, maybe the word I'm looking for is awe. It's like, man, they were, they, there was this passion. There was this, there was this sense of awe that, that, that would describe these first people that gave their life to Jesus. Right? Is that the word you would look for when you walked in church? Awe. I mean, there was passion. In fact, I want to do this with you. I'm going to do like a little word exercise to kind of see what comes to your mind. You, maybe you've done this before, but I'm going to give you a word. And I want you to just, just kind of capture the first word that comes to your mind when I say this word. Now, don't say it out loud. All right, first word that comes to your mind when I say vacation. You're gone, right? You're there already in your mind. First word that comes to mind when I say school. Don't take me back. What about when I say politician? What's the first word that comes to your mind when I say Disney World? Expensive. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not supposed to say it out loud. What about when I say church? What's the first word? I want you to capture that in your mind. What about when I say passion? Listen, I love this story. You've read it before where Jesus walks into the temple in Matthew 21. And then Jesus comes in and he sees the church. And he sees it's not being used for what he created it for. It's turned into this marketplace where they're buying and selling and making money. And there's all these animals in there. And Jesus just begins to go wild. I mean, he turns the tables upside down. He makes this whip and he, he drives all the animals like a stampede right out of the back door of the church. And that passage has always messed with me. Like, what was the deal? Why was he so upset? And then I started thinking, too, you know, there's temple guards in that day. Like, we've got a security team. They have guards sitting at the front doors. And so what were the guards looking at? The whole time Jesus is turning this place into a wreck, and he's running the animals out, and he's running these people out that are making money. Why was everybody just letting Jesus do this? And I'm like you. I think Jesus could defend himself. But what were they looking at? I think they were captured by his passion. I think they were in a sense of awe of who this guy was that came in and had such a different idea for what his church should look like. Listen, the Jesus that we follow, man, he wasn't just a white man in a white robe with a white lamb. It's this idea that we're going to have to detox that picture in our mind. That's not who Jesus is. Listen, Jesus was a passionate leader. Jesus was someone who healed the sick. He brought vision to the blind. He was a Middle Eastern man with passion who loved the unlovable. He stopped storms. He cast out demons. He ate with sinners. He healed people. And he intentionally stopped a, a funeral parade and turned it into a party one time because he raised the person that was dead. That's the Jesus that we worship. That's the Jesus that we follow. Now, what would it look like for Jesus to walk into your church and my church? Does that mean the building? At times, but it also means your home. What would he find? Would he find a passionate follower of Jesus? Or would he say, man, this place is dead? You see, when Luke was writing about those first followers, he said, no, no, no. Listen, they're alive. I mean, there's this sense of awe. It's like, it's like the people that would just followed Christ. They were sitting on the edge of their seats going, what's Jesus going to do next? Who's he going to heal? What sinner is Jesus about to bring into this place? Because I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be blushing because I can't believe who he just brought in this time. What story is Jesus about to tell? What miracle is Jesus about to do? They were ready. They were anxious. They were looking for Jesus to do a work. So that should be us. It's that sense of all. Oh, who is Jesus about to heal? Whose life is he about to change? Whose marriage is he about to save? 
And we're filled with a sense of awe. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Remember, man, detox. Listen, this idea that we just kind of come in and we sit and we stand and we sit and we stand and we go. Uh, that wasn't the model that the first followers put in place. Instead, it was a group of people that were filled with all. Paul begins to write. Maybe you've heard this verse. And again, I think it's been taken out of context a lot. Ephesians 5.18, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. He says, Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Here's what Jesus was saying. It's the same thing about being filled with a sense. Here's what Paul was saying. It's the same thing about being filled with a sense of awe. It's like, you, you know what it looks like for someone to be drunk? I mean, things noticeably change with them. If you were to ask them to walk in a straight line, you, you know, they couldn't do it. When you look in their eyes, they're red instead of clear. So all of a sudden, this person that went from this, like, shy, didn't talk very much, is, like, bubbly and excited. What's wrong with them? Well, they're under the influence of alcohol. And he's saying in this, he's not saying go be Baptist and don't drink. He's saying don't be filled with, this, don't be filled with, with, with alcohol. Instead, be filled with my spirit. Because when you're filled with my spirit, there's something different. In the same way that that person's different when they're filled with alcohol, you also should be different when you are filled with the spirit. We do this all the time with people on the opposite extreme. Right? It's like they're worshiping the devil or something. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with them. Something's changed in them. But you know, listen, that should be true of the other side. When someone accepts Jesus in their life, it should be like something changed in them. There's this sense of awe. There's these fruits of the Spirit. Last week, they've become alive in Christ. And when Luke's writing, he says, I don't know what it was, but man, there was something different about them. This week, I heard an interview uh, with a guy I really like, uh, his name's Bob Goff. I don't know if you've read any of his stuff. Everybody Always is a wonderful book if you're looking for something to read. But he wrote this. I thought this was so cool. It was in an interview, and the interview asked Bob, he said, Bob, how do you live inspired? How do you keep, I love this, how do you keep your sense of awe? Here's what he said. He said, to keep your passion level high, you have to keep your distraction level low. You see, those first followers, they weren't distracted by all the things that distract us. Instead, it was about Jesus and each other. Listen, would you keep your distractions level low so that you can have a sense of awe so you can follow him? The third thing is really easy. There's just three. The third thing is they added to their number daily. Look, when you think about those first followers, and Luke describes them, he was like, man, it was crazy. Like the first time I saw them, there were 3,000. The next time I saw them, there was 4,000. The next time I saw them, oh, my goodness, man, it was like there was 5,000 of them. The next time I saw them, they had moved into different communities. The next time I saw them, they had taken it to another continent. It was like you couldn't contain it. It was contagious. Listen, detox, detox. Listen, if you grew up in church, you almost get mad when you don't know the person you're sitting next to. That is, that's not Acts 2. Listen, the more people you see and the new faces you see, that's because people are drawn to a sense of awe. That's because it's like a magnet. And when you describe the first followers, that's who they were. They drew people in. Man, they couldn't be contained. They couldn't be stopped. That's who we should be as well. Man, we're a group of people that keeps growing. I love this. Just last year, we saw over 1,000 first-time guests come to Venture. And why did they come? Because they heard about something special that was happening. Uh, just this week, I normally uh, get my hair cut by the same person, and she just had, she just had, um, uh, she just had twins, and so she's out. And so I went to Sports Clips. And uh, have you ever been to Sports Clips? It's a really cool place. And um, I went in there and got my number and sat down. And then it came time for me to come. And as soon as I stood up and walked back there, uh, the girl was like, hey, I recognize you. And I was like, awesome. Have you been coming to Venture? She said, yes, I've been coming to Venture. But she said, listen, someone was just in here that I know. And she's been coming to something you guys do on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. And I don't know what it is, but it's really changed her life. I thought, hey, that's recovery. You need to come. Come check it out. She said, yeah. What happened? She heard about a deep sense of awe. She heard about someone whose life had changed. And what did she want to do? She wanted to come. You've seen this. When sports teams start winning, what happens? People start coming. When lives start changing, when there's a sense of awe about what's going to happen in this experience because the Spirit of God is here, people start coming. And that's a good thing. That's something we get to experience because of what God is doing. 
Now listen, I want, you to, I, want to, I want to try to make this an illustration for you so that you can see this because it's not all just about coming here. And uh, this, this uh, a couple of weeks ago, I dropped my kids off at school. I don't know if yours ever do this, but as soon as I dropped them off, it was like, hey, I forgot this, whatever it was, cleaning supplies. If you'll bring cleaning supplies back, I can get some extra points. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll run to Dollar General and then come right back to school and I'll bring it to you and we'll figure this out. So I left school, got out of the line and went up to Dollar General. And I got to Dollar General. This was one of those weeks it was just freezing cold. It literally was in the 20s. And... I parked my car, it's like 7.45, Dollar General opens at 8, and I walked up to the front door, and you know this, all Dollar Generals look the same, from the front door to the cashier is like 10 feet max, and the cashier is at the checkout, but it was 7.50 and it didn't open until 8 o'clock, it's 20 degrees outside, do you think she opened the doors a little early for me? Not so much, and I just stood out there and waited, and I just kind of kept waiting, looking at my clock like... Surely she'll open this a couple minutes early. And she didn't. And I kind of just checked my heart and used that time to pray and be like, give me patience, Lord. And 20 degrees, I walk in kind of shaking, but I made it in. And we started talking, and, and here's what hit me. While I was sitting out there in the cold, I thought, you know what? I think I've forgotten what it's like to be locked out. I've forgotten what it feels like to really just be stuck out in the cold and not be welcomed in to something I'm sitting right outside of. And you know this about Dollar Generals. Man, there's Dollar Generals everywhere. They're on every corner. You can find a Dollar General anywhere you want to go. Say, can I tell you something? That is what we should be like. Listen, it's not just about a campus on the coast or a campus in Stone County or a hunt club campus or whatever building we set up next. We have campuses all across this community. Man, there's a campus right over here in Adrian's house. There's a campus right over here in David's house. There's a campus over here in Drew's house. And it's this idea that it's always open. Man, you don't have to sit out there in the cold and wait on a building to open. It says these first followers, they added their numbers daily because when they went out, they brought people back in. They didn't wait for the doors to open at 8 o'clock. No, man, they were always open because they were always looking. They were always investing. They were always watching for where's their next campus, not just a building. But who's the next person, who's the next place they can invite into a relationship with them eventually have a relationship with Jesus. Now, I want to I narrow this thing down, and I want to end this way. I want to give you a couple of really simple questions that you can walk through. And I want you to think about these. Maybe it's at lunch, or man, take a picture of them on the screen, or you can find them on the app. But I want you to think about how would you answer this. Here's the first one. What are you devoted to? They, they had really simple devotions. They weren't distracted. They were devoted to some things. If I just watched your life for that week and I came back and told Venture, hey, here's what they're devoted to. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You wouldn't believe the time they spent in prayer. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You wouldn't believe the devotions they had at their house. It was really cool the way they opened up God's word. Man, you wouldn't believe the way that that grandparent got on their knees every morning for their grandchildren. It was like anything I'd ever seen. Or would I write back and say, man, they're devoted to baseball. Man, I got to tell you, they're devoted to Mississippi State. They love them. Yeah, but that's just distractions. What would I say you're devoted to? Number two, I love this. What do you need to detox from? And listen, some of you are in the middle of this incredible movement that God's doing right here. But because it doesn't look the way you think it should look, you're missing it. Maybe you never thought you could be a part of a church where you're watching on a screen right now. And because of that, you're missing it. Maybe you're here and you never thought you'd listen to a preacher in blue jeans. And because of that, you're missing it. Maybe you're here and, man, the enemy has put a thought in your mind that says because of something in your past, you're not qualified. And because of that little lie, because of that little seed of doubt that's in there, you're missing it. I said, what's holding you back? What's something that maybe you need to let go of, you need to detox from, so that, man, you can be together, you can take your next step in faith? Here's the third simple thing. Finally, here's the last thing I want to ask you to do. Would you find your place? Listen, your venture, this whole series is us saying, look, when you find your place, when you start a little campus in your home, when you start inviting people, when you get involved, when you invest deeply in this movement, something happens in your heart. You find your purpose. But many of you, you haven't found your place yet. I mean, you come and you go, and we're so glad you come. Don't hear anything about this message that's saying don't come. Keep coming. you got to start somewhere. But, man, don't stop where you are right now. I'll give you a great illustration of that. One of the things that uh, my daughter and I are into right now is cooking. 
And so last night we cooked chocolate chip cookies. And man, they're, they're good cookies, I'm just telling you. But I noticed something about the cookies. It's all about the ingredients. I mean, if we follow the directions and we put in the same ingredients, we get the same cookie at the end. And I, here's what I know about you. Some of you, you have been putting in the same ingredients for generations. We come to church Easter and Christmas, by darn. Hey, you're going to raise my kids and teach them the Bible. I'm just going to bring them there. Hey, when I come, I'm going to give $20. That's just what I do. Hey, listen, I, I don't know that your cookie is all that good. Could we just stop for a minute and say, hey, what was the recipe that the first followers did? You know, the ones that took the gospel from this one thing to something we're talking about 2,000 years later. I mean, we really were like, well, let's go back to the real ingredients. Not to just tradition, not to what your daddy did or your mama did or what First Baptist Church Olo did or whatever. They're, they're a great church. I don't mean that about First Baptist Olo. I just mean it, that might not be the pattern we want to follow. We want to follow Acts 2. And so what do you need to change in your recipe? Remember, you're the church, I'm the church. What do you need to let go of so that you can experience what you haven't experienced yet? Listen, would you step into that? Would you find your place? Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much that you're patient with us. You know, God, I, I, just, I just think about the journey you've taken me on and the times that I've stepped out of my comfort zone and the way that you've blessed me with that. And God, my prayer is just for folks that are watching at different campuses, for folks that are watching online, for all of us that are sitting right here is that we would find our place and that the enemy that the, that the devil has sold us, that our place is just the same as to sit in this seat and listen and go home. That just might not be the reality. God, you might have something bigger when it comes to our purpose and your plan for us in this world. God, the truth is that we are your masterpiece. The truth is that, God, you have plans for us and you have a purpose for us that's more than we could even ask or imagine. And I don't know that we're stepping into that all the way. And so, God, I pray that this would be a Sunday, this would be a marker where we change the ingredients. And at the end of this, God, we have a different thing coming out of the oven. That, God, we'd have an experience, we'd have a relationship with you, we'd have a walk with you that changes us and changes others. God, I thank you that you're patient for us. And, God, I thank you that your word points us back to the truth. And so, God, may we step into who you say we are, not who the world says we are. It's in your name we pray. Amen.